G'day, my name is Brendan, I work at Netflix, and this talk is on Linux systems performance. And if you're in this room earlier, you saw a great talk on Linux performance tuning for MySQL. My goal here is to cover systems performance in 50 minutes. It's a big topic, but I'm going to pick out some facets that are useful to share. So as I mentioned, I work at Netflix, we have uh, we're available most countries in the world. We're deployed on Linux on the EC2 cloud, and we also have FreeBSD for our CDN. The different facets I'll go through are observability methodologies, benchmarking, profiling, tracing, and tuning. And the point of this talk is to take the best of systems performance and condense it down for this audience. I can give a five-day a five day tutorial or a, I once gave a 10 day class on uh, systems performance. And that's great if that's your career, but for, if you're working on databases or you work, you're a developer, you don't need to know that much stuff. So this talk is about condensing it down, selecting just the top material to cover in a short amount of time. The first topic is observability. And I've drawn a diagram showing the system and also hardware. It's a very generic diagram. Obviously, the Linux kernel has many more internals. And there are many tools for Linux as well. And so for this slide, I've got these slides online on SlideShare, uh, and I'll put the URL at the end. This helps us see that there are lots of tools for, for observability and wherever we suspect that there is an issue or whatever part of the system would like to understand, there's likely a tool that we can use to get into it. And there's also these uh, dynamic tracing tools and static tracing tools that allow us to pose arbitrary questions of different subsystems. The point of this slide is pretty much anywhere in Linux, there's going to, going to be a way to observe it and understand it. We care about observability a lot. Tuning is great, and we care about best price performance for our systems, but using observability helps us narrow down the areas we're tuning. As a methodology, you can take various tunables and uh, just randomly go through them and see what makes the system go faster. Uh, the previous talk was better because it selected various specific tunables you should be looking at. Observability tools, however, I use these a lot before I get to tuning so that I know which subsystems make most sense to tune. Going through the tools, these showcase common metrics. And if you're using Linux, you may never SSH on to the command line and use any of those tools. At Netflix, we have tens of thousands of instances on the Netflix cloud, and we just don't log in to SSH and run them all the time. Sometimes, if we're debugging an issue, most of the time we're using a cloud-wide monitoring tool, uh, Netflix Atlas, which is open source, and sometimes a uh, Netflix Vector for an instance analysis tool. There are lots of monitoring tools and analysis tools in our industry, and a lot of them are tailored for MySQL and other databases. Some of them will have some systems performance view and show you some standard metrics. All of the metrics we're generally looking at come from the same places, the same slash proc sources in the kernel. So I want to go through some of these tools briefly and the metrics that they're exposing. And don't worry if you never want to run these tools. You'll be seeing the same metrics in performance monitoring GUIs. Uh, it's also important to point out that even though there's lots of tools, there are extra sources inside the kernel that provide metrics that there currently aren't tools for. Uh, so things like delay accounting and scheduler stats, and we're trying to tool these up and bring in front ends. So even though I, we, I may go through a lot of tools, and you may think, wow, that's, that's it, that's all the tools, Linux generally has a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff in the kernel. And uh, if you really need to observe a subsystem, you may need to write your own tool. The first one I want to mention is uptime. It's just a quick way to print load averages. And 
I've highlighted the last three. So load averages are a, in some ways, a visualization before we had CRTs and before we had uh, graphical displays. So these come from at least the 10x operating system going back to the, the 1960s. And it shows the 1, 5, and 15 minute load averages. Normally today, if we want to look at CPU load, we just do a graph. Graph's are great. So you can look at the historical, it changes over time. I can zoom out to look at it per week, per month. So in some ways, the, that these numbers still exist are an artifact of an era before we had graphs for everything because we were on teletypes and we were logging into mainframes and actually printing the output of commands on paper. They're still kind of useful because they, they're usually everywhere. You see them in top. People even graph the load averages, which is kind of weird because uh, uh, these things originate from, th these, these serve a role that graphing can serve much better if you just graph CPU utilization and run queue latency directly. But they give you an idea of demand, demand on the system. For many Unixes, the load averages are the number of threads that are running on the CPUs plus how many are pending on average. And so if the load average was greater than your CPU count, you know you have more demand than CPUs to dispatch the demand. Linux is a bit different because Linux uses, Linux includes some non-interruptible disk I.O. in the load averages. And so uh, they can get messed up with things like NFS client latency and whatnot. They're not actually that interesting. It's, it's okay. You can spend like five seconds looking at them. Just the, the, the fact that there's one, five, and 15 minutes, like I said with line graphs, lets you know if things are getting busier now, if the one minute num number is higher than the 15 minute. Uh, but apart from that, they're just a very rough idea. They're also not really averages. So they're exponentially damped moving sums. Um, and the one, five, and 15 minutes are time constants. You see them in tools like Top, has them as well. Top is great in that it has the system-wide summary and then per process. And uh, it's a pretty good starting view of, of what's going on in the system. There are a few caveats. It can miss short-lived processes, especially if you do software builds. You may not see all those processes show up. Uh, well, the, there is something called ATOP which tries to fix that. And Top itself, the way it works, it can consume some CPU just to run. Anyone use HTOP? Well, lots of people, well, more than half the people are using HTOP. It's okay, it has some graphical stuff. Uh, it's completely configurable. I get annoyed with HTOP because uh, I, I want to see more metrics show up here, more selectable metrics, because I know the kernel has more metrics than we're currently exposing. And it's coming along, so more of the metrics are getting added in newer versions of HTOP. Uh, there's just more I want to see. I want to see the delays, the like one queue delay stuff get exposed here. So you know, maybe I just need to write the patch and get get it integrated, and then I'll, I'll like it a lot more. Does a reasonable job, just like top system wide summary per process, configurable. Uh, another reason I don't like these is they clear the screen all the time. So uh, if you're looking at a, an intermittent issue and you and you see a screen full and say, wow, there's the issue. I need to take a screenshot. The screen can vanish. And so there's another tool I try to use, uh, PIDSTAT, instead of HTOP. PIDSTAT gives you the rolling summary per process. There's things like VMSTAT. VMSTAT's been around for a long time. It comes from the BSD operating systems. The first line is supposed to be the summary since boot. So just like with the load averages, it gives you some idea of how things are changing over time without having access to a graph. System-wide summary, so the CPUs, this is the average across all the CPUs, which is kind of interesting. I can look at the breakdown of user and system, and my workload probably has some normal ratio, depending on how heavy it is in user space versus the kernel, how much I.O. you're doing. And if that ratio changes, that's a good thing to investigate with other tools. I can also look at memory, and then uh, how many extra threads are, are runnable, runnable tasks. So, I.O. stat, comes from at t Unix. I actually like IS, the Linux version has been improved. I like it because the way it organizes metrics for workload to start with. So I can see reads, writes, throughput, and then the resulting performance. Actually, I don't like IOSTAT on Linux because it's more than 80 characters, and so I have to make the screen bigger. But at least the, the, break, the choice of metrics helps 
let me go through different performance methodologies. Other tools can be modeled off ISTAD. It's uh, because it facilitates those methodologies. I can do workload analysis here. I can look at resulting performance here. Looking for things like A weight to see the average time that the, the, it's taking the disk IO subsystem to respond. Percent utilization, in some ways, is, it's misleading, but it is a, an idea of for what duration during a second was that device doing work. Of course, storage devices can accept more work if they get to 100% because they can run things in parallel, but it's another rough metric. Use other tools to drill down further and find out what they're really doing. Free, you'll see these metrics everywhere, so I can look at different caches inside Linux. Although these are unified, so they do share the same uh, memory space, but at least it gives you a, a breakdown. So we've got buffered for block device IO and cached for the file system page cache. S-Trace is another useful observability tool. Uh, I included it in this summary because you get to see whenever the process is talking to the kernel and making system calls, it's just a great way to characterize the type of I.O. work that it's doing, it's TCP, IP, disk I.O. The problem with S-Trace is it's violent. The way it uses P-Trace to set breakpoints on the entry and exit from system calls it can slow down applications by 100 fold. Has anyone run S-Trace on MySQL? Lots of people, oh, what about production? In production? I mean, if you have to do it, and it solves an issue, like you have to do it. So long as you're aware that this will slow things down. And if you're, if you're debugging like race conditions, well now you've got other race conditions because you're running S-Trace. Uh, the worst cases is when I've found, I run S-Trace on an application, and now the application works. <laughs> <laughs> and so, we, we then talked to the sysadmins, it's like, you know, can we just put strace in the start script for the application and permanently leave it on? Uh, that's when things get a little bit crazy. TCP dump. Actually, I should mention about strace. That's the state of strace now in 2016, but we will fix this. Linux has, for a while, had a buffered kernel tracing. And the engineers, a long time ago, realized that strace should be rewritten. And so there's an effort, at the moment it's, it's under uh, Linux perf events called perf trace. And it gives you an S trace like output. It does buffer tracing. The overhead should be much, much closer to negligible than violent. And so maybe next year or the year after, that effort will have become S trace the command. And we can stop warning people about running S trace. And it's like, hey, just run S trace. It's awesome. <laughs> like almost zero overhead. That would be amazing. Of course, maybe other Unixes will take them some time to catch up, so the, uh, the, the warning might, there may, may still be caveats. TCP dump, it's similar to S-Trace, but instead of looking at events at the Cisco level, I'm looking at events at networking. And again, it's really useful, it solved lots of problems. You can open up the, you can write to a file and open it up in Wireshark with Ethereal. Uh, it does cost overhead. It's been much more optimized than S-Trace over the years, so it uses things like BPF in the kernel and socket ring buffers, but still it struggles once you get to doing things like uh, 10, 10 gigabit ethernet and beyond. Actually running TCP dump on a production workload, you know, you're gonna have a problem. Like what are you gonna do with all that data? You have to write it to the file system that takes CPU cycles. Now the file system, now you're filling up your page cache, then you have to flush it to disk, more CPU cycles, now you're engaging the storage IO subsystem. Now you've got it on disk, what do you do with it? You need to copy it to your local laptop so you can run Ethereal on it. Now you've got more file system IO, more, more CPU cycles. Now you're doing network IO, interfering with the production workload. If you've ever run TCP dump on like a really busy 10 gigabit ethernet system, it, all of these problems become apparent. It's like, wow, now I have like a 20 gigabyte file. <laughs> And, and I'm doing a lot of disk I.O. and I'm interfering with the application, now what? Now I need to copy that to my laptop. So again, it's something that will get much better in the future. So in the kernel, BPF is becoming programmable so that the sort of problems you're using TCP dump to solve, we can write a program to answer them in the kernel. Things like, show me, uh, just show me TCP retransmits with various information, show me round trip time by host, and stuff like that. So we get the kernel to summarize that and give us the summary instead of having to dump every event and then post-process. And out of necessity, 
networks are just getting faster. And this is just a lot more data for us to push around. And so we're going to have to use these tools. Next out, I've just got in my observability section because it's, it has lots of metrics, almost too many metrics these days. It keeps getting new metrics added for every kernel version. And they're pretty useful. Um, I, I like some of the new ones that were added, uh, like uh, doing retransmits, whether it's a sin for retransmit or not. But it takes a long time to dig through these. Uh, this is why we, we kind of need to reinvent some of the network observability, and I'll get into BPF in a bit. I've got Slabtop in the slides just for kernel memory uh, usage. If, uh, just to, uh, the slab allocator is not the only allocator in the kernel, but it is a main one. And so just in case you think, you're just curious, you think the kernel maybe is eating up all your memory, maybe there is a bug, and maybe, maybe something strange is happening, it's just worth a quick look. Uh, PC stat to show page cache residency by file. Uh, this can be pretty useful for databases. I've got this, uh, I've got a bunch of files that I, I want to know what percentage of them are in DRAM right now. And so there's a syscall for this called uh, mincore, for memory incore in, in main memory. And PC stat is just a wrapper that uh, one of my coworkers, Al Toby, wrote, um, which is probably on GitHub somewhere that just makes that syscall for given files and then gives you a nice table. So, useful to find out. Uh, how much of my database files right now are in DRAM? Then there's perf events. Perf events is the perf command in Linux. It is a big multi-tool and I'll get to it in a bit. Going back to this diagram, that's only some of the tools. There's lots and lots and lots more. And the problem becomes, where do you start with all of these tools and where do you stop? So another big facet about systems performance is methodologies. And I'll start with anti-methodologies in case they're familiar. That's the lack of a deliberate methodology. The streetlight anti-method is kind of what I see people do, and that's where, let's run top because that's familiar, let's run ISTAP because that's familiar, let's Google a few things and then run them, and look for obvious issues. And maybe you get lucky and you find an issue. Uh, a problem with it is you can have blind spots because you're just using things that are familiar. Uh, there's also the drunk man anti-method. So this is an observability methodology, this is an experimental methodology, and that's where you tune things at random until the problem goes away. And it's actually useful to give this a name because uh, I came to work one day and the engineers told me, Brennan, last night we, we had to retune everything, and just so that you understand how we tuned it, we used the drunk man anti-method. <laughs> It's like, oh, okay, got it. Like you just just created, smashed in numbers and to see what what worked until the problem went away. So uh, actually making sense of it and debugging it was then my problem. Real methodologies include things like the use method, uh, resource analysis, workload analysis, workload characterization, drill down analysis, and these are useful to guide your usage through all of those tools. I published one late last year on the Netflix tech blog called Linux Performance Analysis in 60 Seconds, where I just showed the top 10 commands I run in the first 60 seconds of an investigation if I happen to be at SSH. This is useful to share with an audience, I think, like, like ourselves, because you don't, you don't want the five-day system performance class. You want the summary. Like, what, what, what can I do if I have limited time for this? And these ones do things like uh, uptime for load averages, just, just to quickly understand if my system's getting uh, busier or more idle. I check that first, because sometimes people will say, I've got a terrible issue on this instance, please check it out. I SSH on, I run uptime, and I see 15 minute load average is 46. One minute load average is five. It's like, ah, oh, I think I missed the issue, because the system's getting much, much lighter. Or if all the load averages are equal, then I know the issue is probably still present. Now, of course, there can be other issue types, it may not be visible in the, in the load averages, but it's just a clue. D-message is great because quite often the kernel knows that things, bad things have happened. And so we'll tell you file systems are full, or I'm under a, a sin flood, or, or I had to um kill something. <laughs> Hopefully not um kill the database. 
and then you have to tune swappiness. But just it's just worth checking. D message, pipe tail. Um, at Netflix, quite often, this has solved problems because you discover that yes, indeed, the Oom killer has gone and killed our production Java process. So just worth checking. Then step one, just to get the um, overall system-wide statistics, just so I know like the CPU breakdown, how main memory is doing, and so on. MP stat minus P all one for the CPU balance in case there is an issue where we have lots of idle cores or idle hyperthreads, and then there's a few that are really hot. And that may mean I need to tune how many threads are doing a particular function or what or, or whatever. PID stat or use top. I like PID stat because it doesn't clear the screen. IS stat to just get a rough idea of disk IO. Memory usage. You can run some minus n dev one just to get the network throughput and utilization. They added utilization percent IF util in the newer versions. So you can look at network IO at the command line. You know, that really should have been added to VMstat for the overall system wide statistics. I think the reason it, it wasn't was VMstat was written in the late 70s before, we, before Ethernet was such a big deal, I, I imagine. So we have to run another tool. You can also run SAR minus n TCP and ETCP for TCP stats. So you've got active and passive opens and retransmits. Active opens are your outbound connections, and passive opens are inbound, where you're, you're accepting a socket, and then top. So that's a great checklist, uh, just, just to hit some of the common low-hanging fruit. Another methodology is the use method, and I developed this many years ago uh, particularly when I was teaching classes in systems performance to help my students not have any blind spots on the system. And also to narrow down how many metrics you have. So if you run NetSat minus S these days, there's over 200 metrics, plus all those CPU metrics and memory metrics. You can easily get to 1,000 metrics on Linux, or several hundred at least. With the use method, what I want is a functional diagram of the system and then I want to say, I only want three metrics, three metrics for each of the components. That's utilization, saturation, and errors. So what that does is, there's only maybe a dozen components on the system. So now I've narrowed down how many metrics we have to check to 30 or 40. It also poses the questions first before you're reaching for the tools. So you're less likely to have blind spots. Or at least you know where you've got the blind spots because you know that there's no way to measure this thing. So a functional diagram might look like this. So for each of these things, including the buses, how do we measure utilization, saturation, and errors? So CPU utilization, saturation, errors, DRAM, disks, network ports. But I kind of want to know the IO controller, network controller, expand interconnect, IO bus, CPU interconnect. They can be done, they're hard. You get all that stuff out of the PMCs uh, on processors. PMCs are performance monitoring counters. And Intel calls them Encore or Uncore. Uncore is things uh, off the core of the CPU. Can be done. Real big pain to go through them all. In fact, I've published a checklist here. So uh, on my website where I, I, I make a good swing at uh, doing these, including for the buses, how to get uh, each of the metrics out. So. That's great because this checklist and the methodology leaves no blind spots. We're able to check everything. It's not so great because it is really cumbersome and even dedicated systems performance engineers will, will struggle to get through every single one of these items. What we absolutely need is this to be in a dashboard. There's lots of performance monitoring and analysis companies out there that make dashboards. And so this is something I talk to them a lot and, and they are realizing and trying to implement so that we, so that if you're, whatever company you're using or if you roll your own dashboard, you can just bring it up and it has the key metrics. At Netflix, we're putting these metrics into the Netflix vector, which is our internal dashboard. Because there's no way you're going through all these commands manually. So use method, this also applies for anything. It doesn't have to be uh, system components. So I might look at my company architecture and say I have databases here, I have web servers here, I have a cache, caches over here, load balances here, and then I can try and see if I've got those three metrics for each of those components in my environment. 
I might bring up MySQL internals and say, I have InnoDB here, I have uh, processing here, I've got pipelines here, I've got thread pools here, and then try to come up with this, just check if these metrics make sense for My, MySQL internals as well. So it's just a methodology to get the brain to think about uh, what you could ask to, that would be useful. In fact, on, on my blog I did this for the Apollo Lunar Module Guidance Computer, which I have no expertise with, but I was able to get the manuals, because they're online, it's fantastic, and then go through and, and find the functional diagram of the Lunar Module Guidance Computer, the block components, and then go through each of them and say, okay, utilization, saturation, and errors. And that methodology would have helped with the 1202 alarm that Neil Armstrong had during the moon landing, because that was actually a CPU saturation errors. There was more, uh, more tasks. They didn't call it the kernel, they called it the executive program. There were more tasks than the executive program could dispatch because it's getting too much information from the, uh, one of the radars. Anyway, just the point is, any system at all, even the system you have no uh, knowledge of, and I had no knowledge of the Lunar Module Guidance Computer before, you can just go through this process. Find the functional diagram, and then put your finger on every component, and say, how do I do each of these? And it's a fairly useful exercise. CP profiling, I've actually written as a method just because it's practical. Uh, that's where we take a CPU profile and then we understand everything in the, in the profile that's more than, say, 1%. It will discover a wide range of issues based on their CPU usage, and I'll go through flame graphs in a moment. So it also helps for tuning to help you under, understand which areas of the system or my application or database matter and what should I be tuning. A couple more methodologies just to mention. Resource analysis is where you start from the bottom. You start with the hardware and work your way up. It's generic, works for any system, uh, can have uneven co coverage and false positives. You, a problem with resource analysis, especially if you look at the disks and say, oh, my disks are really busy, there must be a problem. There's so many layers in between the disks and the application. Caching and, and write back, later asynchronous flushing, that a disk issue you see may not be suffered by the application at all. And so a different approach is to go top down. When you start with the application, say MySQL, and then you work your way down and say, okay, what, what calls are you making? What file system calls are you making? What's their latency? Is it even worth going deeper than that? Is it even worth going into the disk IO subsystem? It's a different approach. So methodologies are great. They can guide your usage through tools. Benchmarking is another important facet of systems performance. And I'll start by saying almost 100% of benchmarks are wrong. I've done a lot of benchmarking, and it's really error prone to do. It's easy to test the wrong target, if, especially if you're doing system benchmarking or instance level benchmarking. So I might be testing the file system cache instead of the disk. So uh, I've, I'm interested in disk performance. I go and download some disk benchmarks off the internet. Even though they're really popular and everyone uses them, they're actually not doing what you think they're doing. They're doing uh, creating a file and then testing latency to the file, not the disk. They're not opening direct flags or they're not doing the right things. And even if I fix that and say, okay, I get it, I get it. I need to fix this benchmark I downloaded. I need to open the source code, find the open, add odirect or whatever. That might be wrong as well. Because does your application do odirect? Does the application actually talk to the disks directly? So a lot of people want to test disk performance because it's deemed useful. And I get the, the concept. In the past, disks were often the bottleneck. So if you selected a system based on who had the best disks, then you're generally fixing the number one bottleneck of your system, so it kind of worked. But nowadays there's so many levels of cache and so much effort to stop having disks as the bottleneck. Uh, a lot of us have been saying that the new bottleneck for a lot of applications is not the disks, it's the memory buses. It's how much memory I.O. we're doing and we're saturating the memory bus. And it's tricky because people aren't normally looking at the memory bus they would if they're using the use method because it's, it's, a, it's a critical item, uh, but it's important. Memory bus stuff, you see it with, say, IPC for instructions per cycle or CPI for cycles per instruction. There's a whole world of performance tuning that we need to get better at. Uh, 
because that is starting to become a number one bottleneck. Now, when everything's cached and the system is just taking network packets, processing them and then throwing them back out again, you start getting to a point where you're just moving I.O. You're just moving bytes back and forth to main memory and that's why the memory bus starts to become more and more of a bottleneck. How do you see if the memory bus is a bottleneck in the system? How would it show up? How would you know? Like just using standard tools. Anyone? Shows up as CPU utilization. So it's like, oh, my system's 100% CPU utilized or 90% CPU utilized. And that's pretty misleading. And it's because utilization is measured from when a thread begins running to when it gets descheduled. During that time, it runs instructions, and then during instructions, we run cycles, and a whole heap of them are stall cycles. But just percent utilization alone has no breakdown of whether you are retiring instructions or you're stalled on main memory. So it is pretty misleading. I can look at systems where, where are 90% utilized, and you give them, in fact, I was doing this at Netflix recently by changing the uh, processor speed, which you can do in the new instance types. So I was deliberately changing the processor speed from 1600 megahertz to 2400 megahertz, to uh, 2800 megahertz, and showing that it didn't actually make a big difference on application performance. Even though the application was CPU bound. It's like, wait a minute, but I'm like, I'm halving the, I was going from 1400 to, to 2800, so I was halving the clock rate. But the application performance was not hugely affected, and that's because it was not clock rate bound. It's not CPU, it's not instruction bound, it's memory cycle bound. Sorry to get on a tangent, it's just really important. This is starting to become an important issue for us to look at. So benchmarking can be misleading. It's just very easy to test the wrong thing. You benchmark A, you measure something else and conclude you've measured a third thing. Also, people publish bad benchmarks all the time and no one has time to refute them because it takes, it can take a week to get to the bottom of a benchmark. So if you see benchmarks published and they're doing the rounds, it doesn't mean that, just because no one's complaining doesn't mean they're authentic, it's we're busy. So there are micro benchmarks where we want to test, say, file system speed, network maximum throughput, uh, macro benchmarks where we want to simulate an application request rate. I use sysbench all the time, it's pretty good for testing various things, not just MySQL, but also CPUs and other things. Bad benchmarks are where you're testing things that can be easily optimized or cheated by the, the system. There's also the benchmark paradox that I want to mention. If you've ever done product performance, where you're trying to convince customers to switch to your product, this is something that you encounter. It's really depressing. In fact, all of benchmarking is really depressing. If your product's chances of winning a benchmark are 50-50, you'll lose, usually lose. So if it's like flipping a coin because people are testing the wrong thing, they aren't analyzing it, they're making the wrong conclusions, sometimes you'll think, well, that's okay, like I'll win half those benchmarks. That's not what I've seen happen in the real world. Uh, salespeople were most of the time losing. And we couldn't understand it. It's like, but, but it's basically random. Why are we losing? And the reason was when customers were evaluating one product over another, be it an operating system or a database, they don't take one benchmark and base their result on that. They want to run several. And to really switch a product, they want the new product to win them all. So if you're flipping a coin, it now becomes, you must flip a coin and get heads four times in a row for the customer to want to switch the product. And that's why we kept losing, is because customers weren't running one benchmark and doing one coin toss, they were doing several, and they wanted it to always win them all. Really annoying. Um, how to fix this? For any given benchmark result, ask why, why this number and why not 10 times faster? And the process of answering that will lead you to root causing the benchmark and finding out what was really tested. And that means using all the observability tools that I mentioned. So it's called active benchmarking, and that's where you want to root cause performance analysis while the benchmark is still running. You can use those tools, answer Y's and not 10X. Profiling is really useful for benchmarking, but in general, that's to understand what's going on. It's another big facet of systems performance. And see if you think you could do this. 
see if you think you could actually answer, like, come up with a breakdown. So I know my Ethernet is 20% CPU, IP is 10%, TCP is 30%, checksumming is 25%. That's a pretty nice breakdown of where CPU time is in kernel components. Hands up if you think you could do this. If I said, here's a system, I want you to do that breakdown. Nobody. This was done by Bill Joy in 1981 on BSD. This is not using some brand new tool. This is something that uh, has been possible for a long time. Once you realize this sort of thing is possible, which is a main point in my talk, the next question is, all right, how? That's, that sounds really useful, how do I do it? Profilers, profilers can, can break down where time is spent. Linux has perf, perf events. The output of perf events, if you run it at the command line, kind of looks like this, I've said, Record 99 hertz, or 99 times per second, all CPUs, call graphs, or stack traces, for 30 seconds. And then the report gives me this hierarchical tree diagram, and I follow the percentages and find out what stack traces are important. The problem with this is, that's the full output of perf events, and it's just too much stuff to read. As a flame graph, that same profile looked like this. That's much better. So what are flame graphs? Anyone using flame graphs already? Oh, excellent, so I've got like a third of the room. For me, <laughs> that's right. Something I came up with a while ago. The x-axis is, is sorted alphabetically. So the x-axis is not the passage of time. So I'm just taking stack traces, which are on the y-axis, I'm sorting them alphabetically, and then I'm merging frames that are, that are adjacent. The color is random, but sometimes I'm using hue to be a dimension. The top edge is what's on CPU and everything beneath it is ancestry. Uh, it's easy to get going, and I also covered it in a, the current issue of ACMQ. So the first ever flame graph I did was for MySQL, uh, back when I worked at Giant, and that was using Dtrace. And that was the full output of Dtrace. There's the size of one stack. And that was it as a flame graph. And, and I was working on a particular issue where the customer had a 40% CPU delta from one system to another. And I was looking at the full profiler output and thinking there's no way I can fix this. But, but I came up with a visualization, the flame graph, and I could see we're spending most of our time in MySQL join. And it was really helpful, really quickly narrowed the investigation. It's like, oh, we just need to tune that. And uh, ended up solving the issue. So flame graphs are really useful. Great for looking at MySQL internals. The workflow for them. Uh, I've got it on the website, but it's perf record, perf script, and then flame graph. There's a new feature coming in uh, the latest Linux kernel where I can, I can cut out what, I can cut out that step because perf report will have a way to emit folded frames, which the Linux kernel engineers added specifically for flame graph generation. So in a couple of years, I'll update this diagram to show the newer, newer method, but this still works for now. So PMCs are great, they, uh, the, no, sorry, the flame graphs are great. PMCs can also be measured by perf events, and that's for when you wanna get into things like uh, cycles, instructions, and so on. So getting into low level CPU, so you can understand if you were memory bound like I mentioned earlier. Tracing, just to mention so that you're aware that it exists. Tracing is where you, if you really wanna get deeper into the system, you can use various tracers. And I've shown the sort of visibility they provide here. Here's a tracing stack. So the backend instrumentation of things like trace points, k-probes, and u-probes, the tracing frameworks, the kernel frameworks, ftrace, perf events, and BPF, front-end tools, perf, which I separated out because all of this stuff is in Linux, it's core Linux, and then there's some add-on things, like uh, my perf tools and a new thing called BCC. And to give you a quick tour so that you know what these can do, ftrace is a, it's been there for a long time, it's Tricky to use, but there are some front ends. It's these files under syskernel debug tracing. I've written some front ends myself, like iosnoop, so you can look at disk IO by latency. 
and also IR latency to show it as a histogram, right? For, for understanding if there's bimodal distributions in disk I.O., much better than, say, IOSTAT. Funk count is also F-trace based, and I can do, say, kernel. I can really get into the kernel and find out which functions are called how many times, whether it's block I.O. or TCP or whatever. Uprobe is another perf tools F-trace based thing that I wrote. Here I'm using it to dynamically trace the dispatch command function out of MySQL, and I'm plucking out the uh, string for doing the, the, the actual command that's being executed. So show tables, select star from numbers where number is greater than whatever. Here I'm actually doing it, and I'm doing a string match in the kernel. So it's only printing out MySQL commands that contain the word select. If this looks new, this has been in the kernel for years and years and years and years and years. People just haven't used it because they didn't know it was there. F-trace. So I started writing front ends recently, perf tools, but uh, they're kind of hacks, but they, do, they, they can get the job done. This should really be part of higher level GUIs. The people who make uh, those monitoring products for a living should be using F-trace. But also the newer things like perf events. Perf events is the perf command. It, does, it can do many of the same things F-Trace can, uh, and then a lot of extra things like PMC support. Perf event source is also getting BPF support, which I'll mention in a second. So Perf events is very good at, trace, at, at matching uh, events, trace points, and here I'm showing getting raw disk I.O. events, I'm matching block RQ complete. So tracing trace points with Perf events. But the new thing that's coming out is BPF, it's been added in stages in Linux. So Linux 3, 15, 19, 4.1, 4.5. We've got more stuff coming in 4.6 as well. By about 4.7, BPF should basically be done in terms of tracing. We'll have all the features we need. And it lets us do things like, uh, this is a, a latency heat, heat map of disk I.O. And that is quantized and measured in kernel where it's efficient. And only the heat map rows are passed to user level. So we should see this in monitoring to tools, and we, we're going to make this work in the monitoring tools at Netflix. So your dashboards should get a lot better. System dashboards should get a le lot better next year going forward once you upgrade to the newer kernels that have this stuff. Uh, Ubuntu Xenial was released today. That's a 4.4 kernel. And that has a lot of BPF. This stuff works in Ubuntu Xenial. So you can get latency heat maps out of the kernel. It's a bit tricky using, I mean, that program is actually in the Linux source code. You can compile and run. Again, we need to have the front ends. I've been working on various front ends. They're part of a package called BCC. And so this front end is ext4 slower, and that's tracing latency at the ext4 level, the file system level. And so I'm saying, only show me a file system IO slower than one millisecond. And that's great, because this is closer to the application, rather than looking at the disks, which can be misleading. It's a better indication of application pain than disk IO. You, you may not be able to use this yet because this is the new cool stuff in Linux 4.4 or 4.5, but this will be in the future. BPF, BPF out of all the different Linux traces that have existed over the years, BPF has in some ways won because it is being integrated into the kernel. There's a map of all the different BCC tools that we've been creating so far that's, that's, from, that's current. So getting into different file systems, getting into TCP, uh, dynamic tracing as well. Run queue latency, look for scheduler issues. The very last section I've got, and I'll just cover it quickly, is tuning. And if you're in this room early, you saw a whole talk on tuning. And for a couple of slides, I've just shared the standard tuning we use on Netflix for instances. Tuning is a little like someone's medicine cabinet. It may be applicable for my workloads, but not yours. It's more useful just to make you aware of the sort of things that can be tuned, rather than the specific numbers. So we do things like, uh, we are running Ubuntu Trusty, but uh, we will disable Apport, the crash reporter, because it can eat too much CPU. Uh, VM swappiness, uh, set that to zero, although you run into the, as you heard in the previous talk, you may run into um killer strife to keep an eye out for. New balancing was also in the previous talk, you know, we found that can eat 40% of CPUs because of a bug in Trusty, but that got fixed in later kernels. So that's a temporary workaround. Huge pages can make a big difference. 
but we also had issues in older kernels. So we're currently disabling them. But again, that's, this is temporary. So in newer kernels, we definitely want to revisit huge pages and get them working. Um, various tuning for the file system, storage I.O., uh, and, and I'll post these slides, networking, and since we're running in as EC2 guests, we do, uh, we do encounter some interesting issues, so this is Zen guests, including we've had issues with the clock source that the kernel uses. So when you're doing like get high res timestamp, that can actually eat a lot of CPU because it goes to the hypervisor and the Zen, uh, the Zen version of it can be a bit slow. So we, we actually tune that down and just use the TSC instead. Plus also other uh, EC2 tuning. How many people are actually deployed in a cloud? So you have to deal with this stuff. A oh, number of people. So yeah, you get some extra things to tune if you're in a cloud that are related to the hypervisor. But the rest of that is standard. So that was what I wanted to cover. Six facets of performance in 50 minutes. Takeaways, if I was to give you a couple of things to do, that checklist of top 10 commands to run and also a tools diagram, I have these printed out on my cubicle wall because if I'm working on an issue and I just forget, I can browse it and it helps jog the memory. Another takeaway I didn't put here but is really useful is flame graphs. Getting flame graphs to work because it, it will quantify where CPU time is. And I, I've had many wins in the past with MySQL and getting CPU flame graphs for that. In the slides, I have uh, more links for reference. And these slides are on, I've already posted them to uh, slideshare.net slash Brennan Gregg. That's my talk. Thank you. And I'll, I guess I'll take a couple of questions and then we'll uh, change rooms. Anyone have any questions? Yes? So we know tools like Trace and DDB can have any performance over there. What sort of overhead do we see from sampling based or filing like surface that's So the question is we know things like S Trace and GDB can have massive performance overhead. GDB should always be the case because it will set breakpoints. S Trace may be fixed two years from now. That's another story. What about sampling-based profiles was the question, sampling-based profilers, like Linux perf events. It has different ways of working the stack. So it really, it's relative to how quickly you're sampling. I sample at 99 hertz, and sometimes I'll sample at 49 hertz. That's really gentle. Each time a sample is taken, I'm, I'm usually using frame pointer-based stack walking. It will walk the frame pointer register, and I've written the stack walker many times before. It's a really fast, efficient operation. So I would expect uh, Linux perf events doing, say, 99 hertz stack trace profiling to be negligible. I don't think you could measure the overhead that would cost. Now, if you use a different profiler, let's say I, I did 1,000 hertz instead of 100. Let's say I did libdwarf walking instead of just frame pointer. Then it, whenever you wake up, it can start to cost more. But in general, uh, 99 hertz frame point based walking should be free. I'm actually profiling Java uh, applications where the stack depth can get to as high as a thousand, which is crazy. But still, it's not too bad to be profiling. Yes? Um, so you just mentioned Java. What about interpreted languages? Can you profile those with perf events? Can I profile interpreted languages with perf events? It depends on every single language. So, whatever the runtime is, when I joined Netflix, we couldn't profile Node.js or Java properly. Both of those have now been fixed. So, and it just depends on the runtime. You have to just have to figure out how can we get perf events to cooperate with that runtime. If you Google perf events and whatever that interpreted language is, you'll probably get up to speed with the latest stuff there is. I think one more question, then we might need to change rooms. One more question. Yes. Uh, so, so, so the the question is, can we make a standard not to not to have like a timer wake up at 33 hertz? So I guess I didn't explain it, but why am I profiling at 99 hertz? Is to avoid lockstep sampling. I actually want 100 hertz samples. I want basically every 10 milliseconds. But if I picked 100 hertz, I might have 
you know, constructive interference and destructive interference. I might sample something that's waking up at 100 hertz logically because the application developer chose that and then my profile will, would be skewed. So that's why I'm picking 99 hertz. Some profiles actually have inbuilt jitter, so they'll, they'll, they'll just deliberately do a little bit of jitter so that they're not going to sample in lockstep. So I don't think, it, I don't think it's a big problem. I think 99 hertz or 97 hertz is going to be fine. So I think we might need to change rooms, but feel free to ask me questions uh, outside 